Lord, again, we come together to be challenged and fed by the power of your word. We pray, Lord, that it is your word. We know, Lord, that it is a word of life, but also a word of death, the word of baptism. We ask that we might be free to die to what is not real, what is not life, what is not good, so that we might fully give ourselves to the good, to God, to your truth. We thank you for leading us all this far. We thank you for creating such faith on earth, such trust in your love, that your love, Lord, could somehow be enough for us to give us the security that we all seem to need. Be our security, Lord. Be our salvation, our safety. We trust that this is already happening within us by your grace. And we pray again in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess uh, it might be a little potpourri of hopefully connected ideas tonight. And hopefully ideas that are building on what we've said so far. I try to describe the kingdom life as living on the threshold, somehow between this world and the next, living between what has been, what, we've, what we thought was reality, what we took time to build up, and what God has promised. And that's why it's so hard to be a kingdom person, because at that place, on the threshold, there's always the, the absence of the familiar. You're always moving into a new area created by God where, where you're not fully at home yet, you see, where you're not in charge, where, where things are not yet familiar and, and certainly not comfortable. To use the Old uh, Testament images, it's, it's where they can't sink down their tent pegs and set up a permanent camp. But they always got to be ready to, to move to the new place that is yet to be revealed by God. So kingdom knowledge has the effect of it always subverts the known, secure world. And uh, from what I hear you saying, it, it's having some of that effect even these days. It, it always pulls out the rug from beneath us, where we thought our securities were at, where we, we thought our explanations were at. It, it takes them away. Uh, the kingdom is, is apparent when, when uh, the past has fallen apart, uh, the system I suppose if we had to use what, what John is using when he talks about the world, the world, we would say today the system huh? and all of its promises and all of its, uh, its rewards. And so in Exodus already we see this, these first images of the kingdom in terms of nomadic people, seeking people who are, who are ready to every moment let go of what they, they think they have for the promise of God. And Abraham and Sarah become the images of, the, of that journey. Uh, and what is the image? It's an image that's recognized by three of the great world religions, huh? Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, all say that somehow this, this Abraham character and what he did epitomizes what faith is all about. Now, three of the great world religions, and it's such a, a simple little story. What is it? What is it he did, huh? So he's got his world, He's got his camels, he's got his goats, he's got his wife, he's got his children, he knows the terrain, he's got a good job, everybody knows who he is in town, he's got his reputation, his self-image, as we've been saying, and into the midst of that supposed but pseudo-security, God breaks in and says, leave it, leave it, let go of it, let go of it. And so the Abrahamic journey is, is walking from what you think you have to what you have no surety of. It's always a promise. It'll always be an exodus. It'll always be a, a letting go. It'll always feel like death. <laughs> it will always feel like death. And again, I get back to our, our most fundamental baptism theology, that that's what it was saying. You have died. Brothers and sisters, we gave our Christian people, the idea they did not have to die at baptism, that, that, that they didn't have to let go of anything, that they didn't have to surrender anything except maybe some kinds of uh, worldly jargon and replace it with some churchy jargon. But it was never really hitting the historical, political, social, economic, as we say, the real order of things. The, the two worlds never seemed to meet. 
One scripture scholar, uh, a, a friend of mine, was, was uh, studying Mark's gospel. And uh, he said, uh, especially the concept of faith in Mark's gospel. And uh, as he, he more and more got to the edges of, of what the idea really is and all the different ways that it's used, he said the closest he could get to it was sort of the Jewish idea of chutzpah, chutzpah, which is sort of a, a crazy, foolish zeal. A, a, when someone does something with chutzpah, they do it with flair, with, with fanaticism, with, with readiness, with impulsiveness, with trust. With, it's got fire and charism to it. Huh? And I think of how little faith I've seen of that character. If that's what Mark is describing, if that's what faith really is, the, the putting your security in, in the Lord, in the Lord's promises, in the Lord's love, in the Lord's future, instead of your own, which is the kingdom, the future created by God. And so kingdom people already beginning with Moses, the prophets, they're always history makers. In other words, they're, they're leading God's people forward into the next age. They're always ready for the next age. And, and it's so sad that that so many of us, uh, although we were led by history makers, epitomized by Jesus himself, so much of religion has become history stoppers. Huh? It's just repeating the same old agenda again and again, out of fear. Repeating the same agenda. That holy man from Brazil, that Bishop Dom Helder Camara, he says that as he looks at history and looks at the church today, he, um, he sees that every group if you look hard enough and if it's in any way been renewed or, or touched by the Lord or people have surrendered to the Lord, it is always characterized by an Abrahamic minority. An Abrahamic minority. And that that's the only way God has ever gotten his work done in all of history. As there, he, he says there's no such thing as a converted group, the whole group. And as I look at religious orders, as I look at lay communities, as I look at parishes and dioceses and nations, it's obvious to me that's true. Uh, you know, these renewal groups came along and said, we're going to totally renew this parish. I haven't found one yet. Huh? And as soon as, as soon as you have even a, a so-called renewed group, within five years, it's an institution. You know, here I thought I was the founder of New Jerusalem, and very quickly it became another institution. Huh? And I thought, well, this certainly won't happen to us. I'm the founder. I mean, I'm going to just keep it reformed. Well, it doesn't happen. The very nature of a group is it institutionalizes itself, huh? It, it, and then it protects itself. And then it, it seeks the level at which it wants to live, and then it sort of digs its heels in and says, it's nice here. And Dom Helder says, it's always going to be a... a an Abrahamic minority, and no more. Inside of every parish, inside of every diocese, religious order, there's always a group, and sometimes a very small group, sometimes no more than two or three gathered in his name, who are willing to let go of what they think they have, what they think they're sure of, for what God is still promising. So those are the prophets. Those are the, uh, the incredibly free people that God is trying to create. Those are the saints those are the history makers who are always going to be standing against the, the proper thinkers of every age, huh? the, the proper thinkers of every group who are, who are invariably bowing down to the great God normal. And what Scripture is, is, is their narrative. It's an honest conversation about where power is really at, where power is really at. The trouble with things like violence is, and, and, and false shows of power is that it doesn't really change the scenario. It changes the actors. Hmm? But it, isn't really, it really isn't radical enough. Violence is not radical enough. It's only nonviolence. Uh, power games are not radical enough. It's only powerlessness, which doesn't just change the actors, but, but changes the very nature in which a power is exercised, in which life is, is, is handed back and forth. And that's, I believe, the new creation. The new social order, the, the, the kingdom that is forever coming, not based on, on competition, on domination, on I'm first, I'm better, but free and cooperative uh, social relationships of, of brotherhood and sisterhood so that community is possible so that communion is possible. 
It's got to be nonviolent. It's got to be non-dominating. One group are always being the givers and the other group always being the takers. Because we perpetuated that kind of thinking so long. The, the gospel givers were the clergy and the gospel takers were the laity. What we've ended up with is just a very, very passive church. Hmm? Now, I, maybe I needn't be saying that to people like yourselves, because huh? you're the first wave of the new social order in our time. He was saying, no, we're not just going to be gospel consumers, always taking. Huh? We've got to find a way also to give. And whenever you see that happening, people breaking out of, of, of the, uh, the world of easy explanations and securities into a life of trust, a life of surrender, a, a life of true community, you know the Spirit is working to lead His people forward in history. And it is, despite all the hard things I've said these days, it is happening at an amazing rate in our, in our time, wherever you go in the world. People recognizing that, that they really are instruments of God's work in the world. So um, this conversation, the scriptural conversation about where power is really at, forever surprises uh, the great middle stream. Huh? Because it's pointing out that it's not where you think. Power is not where you think. Now the temptation of overly religious people is to, to get it highly metaphysical and mystical and spiritual and churchy and, and say, yes, all power comes from God. But, but they never legitimate that. They never authenticate. There's no way to prove that they really mean that. Because huh? it's an easy phrase to say. And the even more surprising place where, where this God, this Christ, has hidden himself, of course, is in what appears to be powerlessness, huh? powerlessness, which is love, which is love, which always appears to be so weak. Uh, listen, even in our day, if, if a major politician hmm, talks, about, uh, talks about forgiveness, he's not going to be reelected. There's no way he'll be reelected. He's considered soft on whatever. You know, uh, we want a hard guy. We want a Rambo. Or we want someone who's tough and... And, and kicks people around. That's the kind of leader we can trust. And there you see, despite all of our Christian talk about love, when it really comes to the, to the world as we know it, we don't believe in it. We don't trust it. And some of the people who will say that the loudest are the good Christians who are thumping their Bibles in a church all the time. Huh? But they don't want any, any president who goes around forgiving people. Hmm? No, sir, we're for vengeance, huh? after all. Well, then what does all this Sunday morning stuff about love mean? Well, it, what, what you force them to say, if you'll stay in conversation, is it really doesn't work in the practical order. Hmm? And they're afraid to admit that to themselves, that after all is said and done, they do not believe in love. They do not believe in nonviolence. They do not believe in the power of the powerless. They do not believe in poverty, hmm? which is constantly being acclaimed by the Scriptures as the way to freedom, the only way not to be possessed is to not let the system possess you and not to possess so much yourself. Now, so, so the, the scriptural voices, as I said earlier, are always the voices of marginality. The view from the side of the victims. The view from the side of the powerless. The view from the side of the bottom, the, the martyrs, whatever word you want to use. And, and we're again learning to hear that. We're again learning to trust that and to say, that seems to be, after all is said and done, where wisdom lies and where truth lies. Now, at the same time, when we use that word poverty, it's like that word love that we talked about earlier in the week. You wish we had more words for it because it means a whole bunch of things, some of which are helpful, some of which are the ones Jesus is talking about, and maybe the others are not. Let's try very quickly to just, just define four different ways that we, we're talking about poverty in, in the Scriptures. First, there's poverty as sin and poverty as emptiness. People who are dead inside. Now that obviously is not the poverty that, that Scripture is idealizing. Huh? The, res the call to, to that kind of poverty is repentance and conversion. The poverty of sin. The, the dead person, there's nothing there. There's nothing inside them. They are not teeming with life. Huh? It's the, the stone. That, that is not a poverty. Obviously, we want to seek. And yet, it does play a part in the whole pattern of salvation. It's, it's for many of us. You know, sin and grace are correlative terms. And 
the only way, at least the human beings I know, the only way we really understand what salvation and grace and freedom and life are is by understanding in a certain sense their opposite. And that's why the great saints are invariably converted sinners. Huh? When, when you, you finally have to eat and taste your own hard-heartedness and your own emptiness, your own coldness, your own absurdity and, and selfishness and all the rest. And that is pretty much the pattern in all of our lives. And, uh, that's why it was such a grace in the hermitage when I was able at last, even as an old German, to, to weep over my sins and to really feel, feel just a tremendous sadness at my own silliness and my own stupidity. To see it in all of its starkness and, and its, its futility, that it doesn't mean anything, it's not going anywhere. I, I think all of us have to confront ourselves as poor people in that way. And that's why... Um, Many of our greatest moments of grace follow upon sometimes our greatest sins, our greatest periods of sinfulness, where we've just been hard-hearted and closed-minded and closed-hearted for years. And the moment of vulnerability and gentleness comes and, and we see it for all that it is and for all, for all that it isn't. Secondly, the Scriptures are, are speaking of poverty as destitution and dehumanization. That is not praised by Jesus. Huh? And some people still get that confused when you talk about the glories of poverty. Uh, we're not talking about uh, uh, the, the non-human being on this earth who has never had a chance to, to, to take in uh, cultural, social, emotional, familial values. I think this is why, brothers and sisters, if any of us have worked with the poor in our own country, why oftentimes it's very, very discouraging to work with the poor in America. Because this second kind of poverty in many ways describes many of the poor in our country who honestly have the worst of both worlds, the worst of both worlds. Often there is not the familial uh, tradition, there is not the, the uh, cultural tradition of inner richness and aliveness. And you hear many missionaries you know, come back from the third world and sing the glories of the poor. And people again and again will come to me and they say, Father, I don't mean to be fighting you, but that just isn't my experience. Huh? Uh, it, it's very different in many other countries where there's little people who have rich family lives, huh? rich spiritual lives, rich inner lives. Huh? And, and they, these are the anawim or the little poor ones that the Bible is exalting and praising huh? as the ones most close to the kingdom, most ready to recognize the response to the kingdom, the call to the kingdom. But what we have so much in our country is, is people who have been familially destitute, huh? culturally destitute, spiritually destitute. And although they're, they're physically poor and dehumanized in some ways, they in fact have middle class and upper class values by reason of television, by reason of, of advertisements. They want the same things that you and I want. huh? And the trouble is they can't get them. So do you see what I mean? The worst of both worlds. And we really need, I think we've all suffered with this in the last 20 years, we really need the wisdom of, of God it, uh, to know how to break in to some of the subcultures of affluent countries. How to break in by grace and freedom and light. It, in great part, I, I think many of these brothers and sisters are going to have to do it themselves because that's the only way they're ever going to experience their own empowerment and God's presence and life within them. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't be in solidarity and shouldn't care. But again and again in so many situations, the people who break out uh, and break back into spiritual freedom in some ways have to do it themselves. Huh? And the most we can do is be willing to stand there with them and not hold them down huh? and not give them any more negative vibrations and energy than they've already been given by society. Most poor people in our culture are, are operating out of what we call victim behavior. And uh, someone who's never been a victim doesn't understand. It just seems to be so self-destructive. And so it's going nowhere. You want to shake them and say, why are you doing that to yourself? But what we do outside of the context of victim behavior is we normally blame the victim. We see that in, in our country uh, en masse right now, blaming the victim. It's always their fault why they're that way. And we refuse to enter into solidarity and say, 
all of us somehow have created this evil, have created this, this negative energy that has forced people to hate themselves so much and to live out of that self-hatred. Uh, the, 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 our words and our attitudes towards certain groups have become self-fulfilling prophecies. Huh? And you see that in so many marginalized groups, the, the tremendous depth of self-hatred. Most minority groups, most people in any country have a different color of skin. Huh? Uh, people who are criminally deviant, homosexuals, anybody who, who culture keeps saying, you're sick, you're sick. In fact, in the course of time, that's what they become. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that everybody is telling me I'm sick and so those are the, the voices that I absorb. So we, as bearers of good news, have to be willing in our own way, however we can, to reverse, to reverse that energy and to tell those same brothers and sisters, even though sometimes they, we don't feel like doing it, huh, the good news that maybe they've never heard huh, of their own dignity, of their own power, that they are sons and daughters of God. Thirdly, the Bible will speak of poverty as simplicity or as the simple life, we say today. Now, uh, this is uh, found in people normally who are centered in persons instead of possessions. And because their life is so centered in persons, they don't, uh, they're getting such satisfaction and such life at that level that they normally don't need to compensate by uh, spending their afternoons in shopping malls and, and buying more things and getting more and more things to, to uh, entertain them. Uh, I was uh, in a, uh, I was just in California last week and, and went to a shopping mall, and uh, I mean it's the most beautiful place architecturally, as California always seems to be able to do, because they can incorporate the outside. But uh, walking through this entire place, you know. There wasn't a single shop that sold a single thing that was necessary, right? And it just, it's just unbelievable that we have the leisure and the luxury for just boutiques, endless boutiques of little pretties, you know? <laughs> and cutesies and, and luxuries and just on and on and on and on. And all these people feverishly with their shopping bags walking around to get these things that, that no one needs. They couldn't possibly need any of that stuff, you know? But, uh, well, that's another story altogether, but that, that's certainly the, certainly the opposite of this poverty as, a, as the simple life. You know in great part those lives might not be based in, in relationship or in solidarities, or certainly not in solidarities with the have-nots. Huh? Uh, few things are needed or desired because uh, the, the person of the simple life is centered on another level of value. And maybe it isn't always highly spiritual, maybe it's music, maybe it's... Uh, Art, maybe it's uh, nature. Huh? You'll meet these folks here and there who can live a very simple, simple life because they're getting so much joy, so much truth and power from that level that they don't need to clutter their lives with other kinds of stuff, as we say. And that simple life would certainly be a, a call. Uh, oh, I'd say it's more an effect. It's like, don't go out to do it. I want you all to start living a simple life tomorrow. No, it's just that as you get centered in God, that's five years from now what your life will look like because you don't need all that stuff. It just doesn't satisfy anymore. It doesn't enrich. It doesn't give you the joy it once did when you were 25 and that just seemed like the, you know, the cat's meow to wear that kind of dress or whatever. It just Then maybe it did, but it, it doesn't anymore. And it's not that you say, oh, it shouldn't, it shouldn't. It just doesn't. Huh? It doesn't. It's okay, but I don't need it. Uh, although it's sort of like Teresa of Avila put it, um, she says, when they serve me partridge, I'll eat partridge. When they serve me porridge, I'll eat porridge. So when uh, the nice dress comes along, you're not going to say, oh, that's an ugly dress. No, it's a nice dress. It's pretty, and I'd probably feel great wearing it. But I don't need it. You understand? That's the difference. Huh? I feel great wearing it, but I don't need it. I, I'm okay without it. I, I know who I am, and I don't need to have this wonderful bit of clothing on to convince myself that I'm, that I'm beautiful or whatever it might be. Finally, there's the, the poverty of being human. And this, I believe, is the poverty that, that Scripture is idealizing. I believe when it says Jesus became human and never sinned, the reason he never sinned was he never rejected this level of poverty. 
He never rejected the limitations of the human scene and tried to, to fight against it or rail against it. It's a gift to accept it and to recognize our own smallness. The joyful acceptance of a limited world. For years I always used that as my definition of Christian maturity. Someone who can joyfully live with limitations. Their own limitations. The limitations that their friends and society and even their family put upon them. That's what's so hard for an affluent culture. So very difficult to accept a limited world. Uh, I know many of you have heard me say it because I've said it many times uh, on my priest retreats. I, I just continue to meet uh, so many holy priests who are recovering alcoholics. And it just strikes me again and again. Uh, I can almost pick them out anymore. There's a kind of littleness from the very beginning, a kind of vulnerability. It's a kind of relaxedness with themselves and with one another. You can tell they're not living in their heads anymore. Huh? You can tell they're not living up here. They're, they're living somewhere down here uh, where that, that they, they had to face at one point in their life their, their littleness, their poverty. They had to wake up one day and say, I'm an alcoholic. And they are some of the greatest priests I meet all over the world. Just, it's almost as if you want to say, well, gosh, maybe we all should become alcoholics. You know? <laughs> and we'd finally, we'd finally get to face our, that, that different level of what it means to be human. Huh? Um, but I think the Lord has a course for all of us where if we're listening and if we're perceptive, we also will, will, will meet our, our reason for humiliation. Huh? You know, the word humility, I'm sure other preachers have told you this, the word human come from the, the Latin root humus, huh? dirt. <laughs> a human being is, is, is someone, as we were reminded on Ash Wednesday, taken out of the earth, huh? and out of the earth, and that's who we are. Uh, and so a human being is one who knows that. A humble person is one who recognizes that's all I am. One of my very favorite quotes is uh, from Carl Jung. He was in his uh, apparently mid-70s, toward the end of his life, and uh, a student of his was reading the book, the classic book, The Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, he came to talk to Carl Jung, the old man, and, and he said, what's your journey been? What's your pilgrim's progress been? And this is what Jung is supposed to have said. He said, my journey, my pilgrim's progress has been to climb down 10,000 ladders. 10,000 ladders. So that now, at the end of my life, I can reach out the hand of friendship to this little clod of earth that I am. Isn't that magnificent? My pilgrim's progress has been this, to climb down 10,000 ladders into truth, not up. All the rest of the world is going up the down staircase while Jesus is entering into his great self-emptying of truth, the place of poverty, the place where truth can be heard and received. Climb down 10,000 ladders. So now at the end of my life, I can reach out the hand of friendship. It's, he's not just tolerating it anymore. He's not just putting up with his humanity. He's not even forgiving it. He's loving it. The hand of friendship to this little clod of earth that I am. Now there is a free man. Huh? There is a person who, who is twice born. And when I hear people so quickly, so easily, after an emotional prayer meeting, say they're born again, you know, when nothing's changed, nothing, except a new jargon, you know, a new terminology. They've made almost no inner journeys, no outer journeys yet, but I'm born again, you know. It's just, it's hard, it's hard not to smile and look away. It really is. And you don't want to put them down, but you just say, brother, sister, you don't know the words you speak. <laughs> what, 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 it, what God does when he... When, when a person really is born again to see what life really means, what freedom really is, what salvation really is, what truth really is, and to think it means to have become churchy. I don't gamble anymore and I don't drink. I'm born again. Well, maybe. You know, I, I can't judge. Maybe, maybe. But um, I, I can more likely believe a Carl Jung when he talks that way. 
And as one of you was saying uh, so rightly at supper, the I, I gave in one of my other uh, tapes the, the the stages of a person's life uh, uh, that come from the Hindus in India. They say the first stage is to be a student. The second stage is to be a householder, to marry and to have your family. Our culture stops right there at the second stage. That's that's the be all and the end all. The third stage is to be the forest dweller or the seeker. And the fourth stage is to be the wise man. We've been calling it the wild man lately, huh? But it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Or the wise woman, huh? or the wild woman. Huh? That's the goal. The goal in cultures of wisdom is to be 70 years old. Doesn't that give us all hope as we're getting closer? Huh? That's the goal, to be a 70-year-old wise man. And see, we live in a culture of non-wisdom, which idealizes having a 21-year-old svelte body. Hmm? that can still fit into a bikini. Huh? And as soon as we've moved away from that, gosh, it's all downhill. Huh? <laughs> what hope is there, you know? What hope is there when you idealize being 21 instead of idealizing being 70 huh? or 75? That's, that's the, the spiritual call to the kingdom. Those are the kind of leaders we need. Huh? And we're not producing them. We're not calling them for it. Huh? Uh, it's it's rare. It's rare to find people. I, I was looking at the world scene and trying to think where. I think Corey might grow into it, you know, if she's given a chance. If history allows her to keep growing, you know, she might be a, a person at a high level of conscience and freedom who can break through. Uh, but uh, I, I don't, you know, I can't of many others. I think uh, Anwar Sadat was such a man. Julius Nyerere in Tanzania. Maybe Abraham Lincoln was for us a hundred years ago. But there aren't many more. I mean, <laughs> most other people just sold out to self-interest, just sell out to the little game, and no idea of, of the big truth that, that, that God is making possible. I think those people who, who are ready for the big truth are those who, who face this fourth poverty. This is what we run from, and yet this is what God offers. And I hope in some way everything I've been talking about this week, that palace of nowhere, that egoless life, hmm, is this kind of poverty. This world of knowing that you and I are broken and weak, utterly fragile and, and, and split kinds of people who, as Paul says in Romans 7, do what we ourselves don't want to do. And then we ask ourselves, why did you do that, huh? <laughs> do you believe in what you believe or don't you believe in what you believe? I guess I don't. You know, I'm just, Lord, I'm just a mass of contradictions and I don't know what to do with myself. As Paul says at the end of Romans 7, who will get me out of this body doomed to death? Huh? And don't you sometimes just want to get out of it? It seems so, so fragile and so hypocritical and so silly. Hmm? And yet to love it, to reach out the hand of friendship to this this, for some unbelievable reason, is what God is working with <laughs> and what God in His patience and humility loves. And I believe that's why He begins His great address with that line, Blessed, how happy, how happy are the poor ones. Huh? How happy are the poor in spirit who've reached that point. Remember that the Beatitudes are not a set of prescriptions. Go out and do that. I'm going to be poor in spirit tomorrow. No, you can't. Right? There are a set of descriptions. Huh? Didn't we say that way, way back? Huh? There are a set of descriptions of people who are kingdom people. When you've surrendered to the kingdom, when you're living this chutzpah kind of faith, huh? when your life is centered in the Lord and not in yourself, you'll take those eight things and, gosh, they describe you. Huh? But you don't set out to, to mourn and you don't set out to be poor in spirit. You can't. That'll be ego again if you do. But after you've surrendered your life to the Lord, that's, that's the way you'll be, in spite of yourself. Because huh? all those other games don't, don't mean anything. So we need to meet Christ in all four types of poverty. Hmm? We need to meet our own sin and emptiness. We need to face the dehumanization that, that is in ourselves and in all human beings and how it takes away their soul and their heart. We need to meet Christ in the simple, uncluttered life that kind of poverty. And we need to meet Christ in the poverty of being human. And that's why the Scriptures again and again idealize poverty, idealize the poor person. And why the, all the religious founders, I know we, we probably lost the real meaning of our vow of poverty, we religious. 
But why, again and again, every religious founder, they'd go back to what they call the evangelical councils, and again and again they'd say poverty, what they call the vow of poverty, was somehow of the essence of Christian life. And we religious were taught that, but I think we we gave our lay people the impression that it was not an evangelical counsel for them. It was not even an ideal, but something to be run from and something to be avoided. And now, darn it, our our people find themselves so trapped because they bought that, that and they don't know how to backtrack. They don't know how do you create a simple life now? How do you let go? How do you turn around and learn to love your imperfection when, darn it, they told me for 40 years I had to be perfect, hmm? And now here I come along and you're changing the rules, Father. Huh? You're saying it's okay to be imperfect. And I'm not idealizing sin. I'm simply allowing us, I hope, to, to recognize truth. And then your sins take care of themselves. God takes care of your sins. Vincent de Paul, that, that wonderful lover of the poor, I'm sure the Sisters of Charity will appreciate this, says the poor are everything we are and everything we are to become. They're the icons of freedom. And of course, that's why we're so threatened by them. That's why we project our shadow and our darkness onto marginalized groups, onto people who are different, people who we think are inferior, because they come before us with their their handicaps, with their brokenness, with their failures, and they reveal to us what our souls are, that we are handicapped that we are refugee, that we are imprisoned, huh? that we are a mixture of male and female, that we are, have nowhere to lay our head, really. And every, every group that is marginalized and is put to the edge always has a message for us. They always have a message for us. They're the icons of God, and these are the people we hate because they represent what we most fear within ourselves and what we most deny within ourselves. And so the poor in the chemistry of God's salvation are somehow the instruments of God's breakthrough, the instruments of God's truth to all of us. And there's a thousand faces to poverty. Again, I use the example that I I mentioned earlier in the week, the the mentally handicapped or or physically handicapped child. How many of you don't know a truly holy couple? Hmm? And and probably they wouldn't be. Probably they wouldn't be, except that third child had a Down syndrome. And it just, it was that brick wall that they had to come up against and ask a whole new set of questions about what does it mean to be human? Does it necessarily mean to be a functional, effective, uh, articulate, pragmatic uh, uh, person who isn't going to be on the welfare rolls? No, it can't mean that because this is my son and I love him. And he's not going to be of any use all his years on this earth. All he's going to take is giving, giving. He's never going to be able to give back at all. I'm going to have to give for 50 years and maybe hope for a smile from him once in a while, which apparently is enough for many of these mothers. That's enough to keep him going, just that smile now and then. I remember as a seminarian when we first went to visit a a home for the uh, severely handicapped, uh, physically handicapped, although many were, were uh, mentally handicapped too. and I had come from, you know, middle-class society. I had never seen such bodies. I, I had no idea bodies could be twisted to that degree and, and lives could be that wrong. I mean, that's all. I remember the man in particular who in his entire life had, had been lying on his chest with his, his arms bent behind him and his legs bent behind him. And every meal he'd ever eaten, Someone else had to feed him. Every time he'd had a bowel movement, someone else had to take care of him. And everything inside him, he says, why? You know? and, and then I said, gosh, I'm not a Franciscan. You know? I don't understand poverty. I don't understand poverty at all. It's just, why would God create someone like this? They're useless. And, and it shakes every bit of your theology, every bit of your psychology, every bit of your understanding about what does it mean to be a human being? What is God doing on this earth? Why does God create bodies like this and human beings like this who don't fit the bill? And I think it's only in those kinds of confrontations that we get close to the meaning of salvation, that we get close to the meaning of 
of what, what freedom and life and truth really are. That's why we need the poor. That's why the church can separate itself from the little ones, the marginalized ones, the poor ones only to its own loss. It loses the gospel in every age when it separates itself from, as the scriptures first say, the widows and the orphans. The people who aren't making it, the people who aren't right. <laughs> uh, we forget the questions. We forget, certainly forget the answers, and we, and, and we don't know where to go for the power anymore. And at that point, what we start doing is creating idolatrous religion to give us the consolation that we, that we can't find in human relationships anymore, to give us the joy that we can't find anymore in self-surrender and, and, and selfless love for other people, because, because that is not being called forth from us. We try to create this pseudo-joy and this, this pseudo-happiness of of various levels of, of religious consolation. But the sad thing is, and the truthful thing is, that for the most part it never seems to work. So I mentioned to you earlier that, that I felt the two sort of acid tests of, of our inner life are silence and service. And I just want to repeat that again, and particularly in this moment talk a, a bit about service. Um, all the great mythologies, the Greek mythologies, the great stories of journeys are always stories of action. Action. Problems are not solved in the head. Problems are not solved behind books and in study halls and in, in libraries and, and classrooms. And it's, it's a first world people who seem to think that they can do life that way. They can just think about things and get their thoughts straight. Again, I have a feeling that that's why we're producing a lot of unhappy people. Because they're trying to solve life in their heads. They're trying to deal with reality in, in terms of ideas instead of action. And, and if the Bible is anything, it's God's involvement in, in the actions of history and the actions of human beings. The great image of this for, for us as Catholic Christians, I think, is Mary's visitation. Uh, last year I gave retreat in the Holy Land to the, the, the Franciscans who, as you know, we, we care for all the shrines over there. And uh, we had our retreat in the, in the little town of Ancaram, the town of John the Baptist. And uh, in fact, uh, the friars, we, we're great at real estate over there. We have all the prime real estate everywhere in, in Israel. The friars have been buying land for 800 years. Wherever Jesus did anything, the Franciscans bought land. Huh? And uh, the, the shenanigans they've gone through to get that, I don't want to tell you about it. But anyway, sure enough, there in Ann Karam, the house that's supposed to be John the Baptist, we have that, and that's where our retreat was, right on the supposed house of John the Baptist. And then right across the valley is the Church of the Visitation. Maybe some of you have been there. So every night after I'd talk to the friars all day, I'd, I'd walk across the valley and sit on a beautiful wall and look over the area and try to picture uh, Mary coming uh, from Nazareth, which is quite a walk, by the way, and would have certainly taken some days, uh, up into this valley and, and to this place where she is supposed to have met Elizabeth. Um, but as I read the story, uh, what I was struck by was how different her response is to what my response probably would have been. If I found out I was to be the mother of God, huh? you know, I, my, my thing, well, well I got to go make a 30-day retreat or something, all right? I got, I got to go into solitude and get it together and purify my motives and, and work this out theologically. And it would all be go inside, see? And, and read the passage. It says, immediately. Can you imagine? She is that out of herself. She is that free of her need to get it together and explain it and understand it. Huh? Immediately, she set out, huh? for the hill country of Judea to, to deal with her cousin, who she heard was, was pregnant too. Now there, you know, there it is. The Mary images are always so simple that we can miss them. Huh? They're, so, they're so right on. They're so clear cut. They're so defined. Huh? And here it is, the primacy of action. Huh? God can teach me taking care of my, my cousin who's pregnant. Huh? Moving toward the world as it is. As I said before, I think when we respond to need as it's right in front of us, Usually, that's not at all subject to ego. It just, it just isn't. Huh? It's when we create a, oh, big, 
big kinds of uh, theories or theologies in our head that we're living up to or we're carrying out. We're doing this to prove our commitment. We're doing this to prove how generous we are. Uh, those are always subject to, to terrible kinds of narcissism. When we just see a need and it pulls us out of ourselves and we have to do it because it's there. I think that's how I see people being purified. And it's that kind of spirituality that I can trust. If your life is not moving toward, toward practical action in this world as it is right now, huh, with other people, with the not me, I can't trust your spirituality. I can't. But I, I hope you're hearing, me, you're hearing me say that on the other side of silence. I still am encouraging you to take the radical inner journey too. Not just the superficial inner journey. A radical inner journey, and that will allow me to trust these kind of radical actions, radical outer journeys that God invariably calls his people on. Those are the two extremes that sort of really define the faith-filled life. And, and sad to me is that most Christianity, as I see it, is right in the middle. It's neither one of them, right? It's not radical interiority and not radical prophecy. Not, not really the rubber ever meeting the road and Christ uh, dealing with the pain of history through us and in us. And, and so I guess I'm just saying it to, to give you permission to trust yourselves at that level. And, and if, if uh, one or the other of those journeys is still lacking in your life, uh, maybe to ask the Lord for guidance. Huh? To ask the Lord for guidance. How are you to go inside and how are you to go outside? How are you to, to enter in to solidarity with the pain and the injustice and the peacelessness of this world? And how are you to, to enter in here and face the, the darkness, the, the ego trips, the fears, the selfishness that, that you and I are so endlessly trapped?